All right, everyone. So we're going to do Power Query in 20 minutes and try to talk a little bit about how it works or some things that makes it a unique tool. Um, so very quickly, I work as a Power BI consultant. So people pay me to make reports and help with their modeling, and no one's asked for a refund yet, so I'm taking that as a good sign. I also make training courses either self-hosted or on Pluralsight, and I love Power Query. And that's not a joke. That's not just me making up stuff. It's one of the most convenient tools for working with data in my experience. I truly wish that they would add it to SQL Server because sometimes you have a CSV file or an XML file and it's just a pain to make an SSIS script to get it into the database. And sometimes you just wish there was a thing where five clicks, you have the data. So a little bit of a quick history lesson. It is a business-friendly data transformation tool. And what I mean by business-friendly is poor Chris in accounting has been left with a bunch of exports from Dynamics Great Plains or some other ERP system, and they need to get the data into a workable format. They don't have support from IT, and this tool was optimized for that use case. And what you'll find is the 80-20 rule applies. 80% of the things are super easy with Power Query, and then the other 20% are a little bit of a nightmare, right? Because it's designed for the business user in mind. It started out as an Excel add-in. There was a period in time where Microsoft felt the best way to market something was to add the word power to everything. So in Excel, we had Power Pivot, Power Query, Power View, and Power Map, but we don't talk about Power Map. That was the fourth like stepchild. Um, but eventually, Satya said, you know what? I want to make more money. Where can we get money? The cloud. Cloud and subscriptions. So we're going to kill Tableau, and we're going to just put all these Excel add-ins together, pretend it's a single cohesive product, and Power BI was born. And you may think, OK, well, good news. We've got Fabric. We can get away from Power Query. Well, bad news. Power Query is there, too. They're calling it data flows, but it's still Power Query. You're not getting rid of it. You're not going to avoid it. But the question is, what is Power Query. What really is it? And so there's uh, three things I want to focus on. First is it's a toolkit of all these different data transformations. You need to trim a string. You need to add a column. You need to add some logic. You need to pivot. It is a toolkit for working with your data. Second, you can make a bunch of transformations without ever writing a single line of code, right? The whole clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy kind of thing. And then third, it's a very linear set of transformations. And in fact, you can see them and see the data as it's being transformed, right? So you can actually see, oh, I added this column, I made this change, and here's what it looks like. And that's one of my favorite features. So what is Power Query? Well, Power Query is a lie. All of that is a lie. That's what Microsoft would want you to think. But in reality, if you want to be learning about Power Query, there's something insidious beneath the surface. So let's start with the whole toolkit kind of piece, all right? It's more of a junk drawer. Now, I don't know if the Europeans have the idea of a junk drawer, but when I was a child, I lived with my Depression-era grandparents, and so this was the junk drawer. I don't recall ever seeing a baby in our household, so I don't know we had a, why we had a binky. Um, I really don't know why we put a CD in a drawer. That is not a good way to maintain a CD. And so one of the biggest challenges of learning Power Query, one of the biggest frustrations, is not the tool itself. There's a button for everything. It's finding the button, right? So here's one of the ribbons for Power Query, right? And I, I, I sincerely feel bad for the developers, because I'm sure someone put together, it's like, all right, here's stuff that applies to any column, text columns, number columns, and now, if they change it, everyone's going to be mad, right? But this never made a ton of sense to me. Some of the ways that I think about it, though, is combining data. That's generally one of the first things that I'm going to be doing, is do I have to do any joins? Do I have to do any appends? I will be making changes to columns. So oftentimes, I might split a column. I might change a data type. I might add new columns. I might modify rows. This is extremely common when you're dealing with uh, CSV files, flat files, anything like that, right? Because you have to promote those headers or make changes to those headers. It's also very common whenever you're dealing with time-related data, 
Because yes, you could bring in all 15 years of the company history, but generally for Power BI reporting, you only need the last couple of years. And when to compare this year to last year, and maybe a few other changes. Um, there's a lot of support for string manipulation. And again, one of the things to understand is that this tool was not built for you. I mean, maybe there's a Chris in accounting here, but for the IT professionals, this tool was not built for you. It was built for the poor person whose data lake consists of a shared drive somewhere with MS Access, Excel, and C weekly CSV dumps. And so when you have that scenario, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. For example, let's say that you had a date column and you see a date of 01-02-2024. Well, because I'm a dumb American, I think that's January 2nd, right? Whereas most of you here would say, oh, uh, did I get that right? Yes, uh, anyway, <laughs> I can't even get it right in my head. But it's not specified, right? So there's lots and lots of tools that only make sense when you realize that people have data that isn't in structured formats in databases or any of that sort of thing. And then there's just a whole pile of other miscellaneous kind of features, right? The way that I explain it is if you could pay someone minimum wage to do it manually in Excel, you can do it with the M language, right? So it's not the creme de la creme, it's not the most advanced, but it can do a lot of basic stuff. It's just, you gotta find where the button is. So that's the first lie. <laughs> Second lie, no code. Um, no, code. Uh, everything that you do is actually generating M code. They just don't show it to you. And again, like I said, there's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of what you ever need to do with Power Query, there's a button for it, and yes, you have to click around to find it, but once you find it, it works. And that other 20%, you're reading some Imka Feldman blog post about how you can do like recursive self-joins, and you're just hating your choices in life, right? So. Again, it looks like, okay, here's our steps. We do this and this and this and this. And again, no code in sight, just some names and some gear icons. We're safe from writing code. But behind the scenes, it's generating M code. And you're not going to be able to get away from having to learn some of this M code. Usually I'm going in here because sometimes it's easier just to manually add steps or make some changes. But there are plenty of times where I cannot do what I want with the user interface, right? If I want to make a function, it's way easier to do it through the code. So you may think you're getting away from it, but you're not. Um, and so then, the last one, linear transformations. So the idea being presented here is that it's like a recipe. It's like baking a cake. You do A, and then B, and then C, and then D. And that's the way that it shows it to you. You saw the picture where, okay, we can click on a specific step, we can see how the data is. Makes sense, right? Power Query is lazy. You tell it to do something, and it'll figure out the best solution, but it's not gonna do what you told it to do. That's the third lie when it comes to Power Query. And so what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that you wanna make some brownies, right? And so you, have, you find some recipe on the internet, or maybe you ask ChatGPT for a recipe. Now, can <laughs> I see at least one person making a face. Can anyone see anything wrong with this recipe? Yeah, we got some? Yeah, so um, generally speaking, you don't need asparagus for brownies. I, again, maybe some of you cook it that way. And the reason I bring this up is Power Query is smarter than you. If you tell it, hey, I want some asparagus in my brownies, and then you never have a step to actually add it in to the final result, it'll just get rid of it. It'll say, we don't need that step, right? And you can test this. Um, you can, if you're smart like Chris Webb, and you actually know how to write M code, which I don't, so I don't have a demo for it, um, you can add a step that delays for a few seconds. Or if you're a SQL Server developer, you can write a stored proc that says, wait two seconds, wait five seconds, do a join against that, or an outer apply, whatever it would be, technically speaking, and then get rid of the column it produces. Power Query will never ask for it, right? So even though it's showing you this UI, hold on, oh, come on, get back there. 
It's showing you this UI, and it's saying, oh, yeah, yeah, boss, we're going to rename those columns. I promise. I promise we're doing that work. Power Query does not listen to you. It's going to take things into its own hands. But it goes further than that. It's, even then, it's still lying to you. It's like, OK, I actually appreciate that you're not just doing what I say, but you're going to do what I need, right? No, 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 no. So we decided we don't need that. But Power Query is lazy. If it can get somebody else to do the work, then it's going to do that instead. And so you say, hey, make some brownies. Here's the recipe. And it says, well, what if I just go to the grocery store and just buy some brownie mix? What if I don't even have to do any of the steps? And what that brownie mix is is called query folding. If you're pulling data from a data source that supports it, Power Query will actually integrate those steps into the query. So the way that you can tell is you can go to a step, and you can right click, and you can say, view native query. Um, again, this is going to depend entirely on the data source and whether it's supported. Although, in fact, you could write a custom connector if you wanted to and enable query folding. Additionally, sometimes this will be grayed out. That usually means that you have a step that broke query folding, but not always, right? The only way to be absolutely sure is to run a trace on your source system and see what it's sending you. But if you select view native query, we can see here some of the ugliest SQL code you'll ever see, right? Because I, I don't know for sure. I know it's machine generated, but I think the reason why you see all those columns being repeated, part of that is that it's checking to make sure that they exist. Because I've seen plenty of times where it's asking for columns, and then it doesn't actually need them. But the key part here is it's doing a couple things that we can see. So in that first part, we can see that it's making our custom column. So we made our new line total, and we're multiplying unit price times the discount times order quantity, right? So instead of doing that calculation in Power Query, which would be inefficient, it's saying, hey, SQL Server, you've got like 16 cores and a, a terabyte of RAM. Why don't you do it? Because one of the things to understand is, generally speaking, Power Query is kind of wimpy when it comes to compute and resources. There's a couple reasons for this. One, it's not given a ton of memory. Um, I forget off the top of my head. I think at one point it was like 250-some megabytes of RAM per container. I think they've bumped it up to like 700. I, I forget exactly. But also, generally, you've got this on-premises data gateway that's been put somewhere on a machine that maybe doesn't have the best resources. The other thing, too, is that at the bottom we have a filter. Ignore the weird scientific notation. I don't know why it decided to do that. Um, but it's filtering out based on unit price. Well, again, if you have a DBA or you pretend to be one on TV, then you probably have some indexes that can make filtering and seeking and scanning a lot faster, right? So it makes a lot of sense that Power Query should push that work back to the source system. So um, just to kind of recap, and actually I think we'll have time for a question or two. Um, what is Power Query? What is Power Query really, not what Microsoft tells you? So the very first thing is that it's a bit of a junk drawer, right? The most difficult part of learning Power Query is finding the button. And in some ways, that's a testament to how good of a tool that it is. Once you understand how to use it, it's extremely intuitive because it's a little bit of a lie, but it presents you this series of linear steps. You can look at the data at every part of the step, and you can see the changes. So that's one of the reasons that I love it, right? I, it's very easy to teach people. But you have to find the button. The second one is, even if you don't think you're writing code, you're writing code, right? And you can run into this as a problem sometimes, because if you rearrange steps, or if you insert a step in the middle, it'll warn you, you might break things. And I can't remember who came up with this definition, but if, it, if a, a semicolon somewhere can break it, then it's not no code, right? And that rearranging can break things because it might be pointing to a column name that isn't there anymore, for example, right? So I recommend at least trying to get a little bit familiar with M code. Again, 80, 90% of the time I'm working with Power Query, I don't need to touch a line of code, but there's going to be times that you need to or times that, at the very least, it's faster to just change something 
in the Power Query code than it is to go through um, the gear icons. Um, one perfect example is, let's say that you remove specific columns. Um, there's, to my recollection, there's no gear icon to go back and change that, so you have to edit in the code. And then finally, Power Query is lazy. You may say, hey, do this and this and this and this, but if you don't actually need that at the end result, it's not going to do it for you. The one exception is if you decide to sort the data, which I've seen a customer do, it will sort the data, because in theory it could help. Um, <laughs> so you still have to be careful about whenever you clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy. But um, that's one of the actually good things about it. One of the reasons that Power Query is performant right out of the box is because it'll try to do as little work as possible because that's not what it's good for, right? It's much more of a Swiss army knife than a scalpel or anything like that. So uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your feedback. Does anyone have any quick questions? So we've got a couple minutes. Yeah, please. Um, so the question is, can you force it to execute the steps, and can you disable query folding if you wanted to? Um, I'm honestly not sure off the off the top of my head if you can get it to not do that. Does anyone here, uh, I got in the back. Uh, so what she's saying is, for SQL at least, you can hard code the SQL statement. You can specify the SQL that you want it to run. Um, but off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with a way to tell it, no, don't do that. There's also buffering with lists. Yeah. Yeah, I think you were talking about the buffering, right? Yeah, so you can buffer the results, which will force it to calculate whatever it's, it's doing. So that's the other option. Yeah, question back? Yeah, so some, uh, I think what she's saying is some steps will um, break query folding, right? So theory, if you move those to the beginning, but I've been burnt by that, right? I'll do demos where I'm like, here's how you break query folding, and then they're too smart at Microsoft, and some of the steps will still fold. So great question. I think we've got time for like one. Oh. Perfect. So the question is, I, I think like, okay, does it not do anything? And then if you're trying to get the highest value, is that gonna break things because it's not gonna sort until it needs it? So the, the actual reality is that it depends a lot on the step, right? If you do a sort, a sort is going to happen unless you decide that you don't need that table at all, right? So if you remove all the columns from that table or something like that, um, there's some steps that it knows how to push down to SQL, and so it will push those down if it can. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if I 100% get that, get that question. Um, We've got two more minutes, so one more question, please. So Power Query, just the, I can, let me show you all real quick. Let's see, can we get, let's see if we can get to, oh, is it? Duplicate, there we go, all right. So Power Query is available in Excel. Um, where I'm used to using it is in Power BI. And so here's the Power Query editor within that. So in Excel, it's called Get and Transform Data. I can go to the advanced editor to see all the code that it generates. And like I said, you can right click to see if view native query is happening, if it's producing that SQL query. Um, again, you can't 100% trust that, but in general, you should be moving any of those foldable steps, so the ones where it shows view to native query, to the beginning, so you can be sure that they happen, right? All right. I think that's time. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it.